All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. It's good to be able to gather together again virtually. We'll uh, start like we always do. We'll do our whip around of just a quick check in, see how everybody's doing, if we have any updates. And then we'll, uh, we'll begin with the study itself. I'm going to start with the way that you're ordered on my screen, uh, which won't match yours, but um, we'll start up with Kurt. Good morning, everybody. Nothing's changed except I got my pool open, so I need to go in. I'm sure I'm going to have seven grandchildren in there ASAP. Uh, but other than that, I'm feeling okay. And um, it's good. Right. Thank God. Morning, Janet. Morning, everybody. Everything's good here. Nothing has changed. Getting back to work, which is a good thing. And. Um, that's it. Everything's good. I can't complain. Okay. Coming to us from Arizona, Debbie. Hey. I'm doing okay. I'm, not, I'm having major surgery on Wednesday. Hmm. So they're going to take my old knee out and take, put a new one in. I have an infection. Oh. So, but I've been in rehab since the 11th of April. So oh, gosh. I haven't been able to enjoy Arizona sunshine yet. Hmm. But I'm hanging in there. Miss you guys. Yeah, we miss you too. And it's good to be able to connect. Russ is joining us from outer space. Yeah, sort of. I'm at the space station today. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's been a rough week, so. I need Part to of the SpaceX out. crew. You know, was, uh, other than really nothing much has changed other than we're, we're really getting back to normal. We reopened. Officially, we can have traffic, um, but due to the size of our building, our restriction is 750 people in the showroom, mm. which we'll never see, thank God. But yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm far away from that place. That's not some place I want to be. I don't envy those guys at all having to actually speak to people. Some of mm. them have actually been doing much better remotely than they've ever done in person. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, other than this... that, things are good. Susan watched the baby all week this week, and um, that's why she's not here. She's still sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, that she has a, a Zoom meeting at 930, so she was like, uh, I'll try to come in for half an hour. We'll see what happens. Okay. <laughs> but other than that, everything's really pretty good. It's, you know, trying to enjoy the weather on the weekends since I haven't worked the weekend since it started, thankfully. And hopefully I never will again. Hmm. Derek, good morning. Morning. Um, everything's good. Uh, last week I did take a little vacation back. I went back to my old school in Ohio. Saw some of my old buddies, saw some of my old professors, and uh, you know it was good to get away and uh, you know, just drive for a little bit. And uh, yeah, it was it was good. So I'm, I'm glad to be back. And you know things are picking up at work, so I can't really complain. Great. Morning, Joe. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. We are doing well here. Um, you know, everything is status quo, but I think uh, we, a prayer for Debbie with her surgery coming up. And also Kurt is having surgery on July 14th on his back, so we should keep him in our prayers. Oh, for sure. And that's about it. Everything is going well. I even got a haircut from the landscaper. Ah, there you go. <laughs> Morning, Patty. Good morning. Uh, things are going as well as they can. The uh, company has announced that they're going to have some major layoffs coming, so um, and they're not going to give us as much time as they typically do. Typically, if they're going to lay you off, they give you 30 days to try to find another job internally, mm -hmm. and they said that they're not going to do that because there's no other jobs to get within oh. the company. So they're going to let us go in 15 days. So oh, uh, I'm just lucky that I'm at retirement. So I could, mm -hmm. you know, if it happened to tap me, I'm good to go. But, you know, I feel bad for my peers that mm -hmm. don't have as much service. So we'll see how that goes. And who knows when they'll do it either. So, yeah. you know, it's just looming over your head all the time as you try to work. Yeah, it's a lot of stress. And I'm sure it's a lot of companies now needing to do the same thing to mm. try to 
regain some money, financial stuff. So we'll see how it goes. But I'm ready to go if if they tap me. So okay. uh, it's good. That's it. Oh, and good morning. Good morning, I think. Keeps going on and off on me. Saying I have a bad connection. Well, we had you for a minute. Everybody's <laughs> frozen. Had to say something, right? All right. Well, why don't we uh, why don't we start with prayer, then we'll dive into the scripture. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this beautiful day, for the gift of sunshine, for the gift of pleasant weather, for the opportunity to be able to, to go outside, hopefully, and enjoy some of uh, your creation. Lord, we, we pray that you strengthen us to walk a life of your disciple, that we may spread your good news in both our words and our deeds we may contribute to make positive change in this world. Lord, be with us to now today in our time of study. Open our hearts and our minds and our ears to, to hear your word, and it may change our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we are going to focus on our gospel text for today. It's Matthew chapter 9 verse 35 through verse 10 or chapter 10 verse 8 and i'll pull it up on the screen here let's see all right all the cities and villages teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the good news, the news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are... Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, <clears throat> Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphasus, and Zadaeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. Those, those 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. Here ends the reading. All right. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Joe and Owen. I didn't mean to step on Owen's toes, but it looked uh, sounded uh, like he was. I said it might cut out. I yeah, think we're gonna have to go there for a second. <laughs> I'm gonna have to turn this off and use the phone. I keep saying I have a poor connection. No. Yeah. Not physically. It's gotta be the inside that modem thing. Maybe they're talking about you all in the poor connection. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me let me uh, turn this off and get the phone on. Okay. So after Jesus is baptized, he spends time being tested and prepared in the wilderness. Once his ministry is launched, he proceeds to call his disciples, and he trains them about his mission. Jesus expands his mission outreach efforts by commissioning and sending his disciples. So he spent the first year training them before he sends them out. 
Why do you think it was important for Jesus to teach his disciples in their first year together? So they would know how to get the word out. Okay. And it's like everything. You, you need to be trained before you can go, go out and do something, especially such an important mission. Mm. Needed his guidance for that. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why it was a year? Not two years or six months? That's a good question. And did he train them all at the same time or at different times? Well, it seems like, at least from the evidence that we have in the scripture, that it was a mix. That there were lessons where he had all 12 around him. But then there were other times, like during the transfiguration, where he would just take three or just take a couple at a time, and he would pull them aside for a specific lesson that was more tailored to them. Yes, he knew the, um, the hey. strengths were of each person, so maybe he zeroed in and said, oh, he's good at this, he's good at that. Yep. Yeah, and we see that uh, by the end, right? In the end, after, um, after Jesus... Um, is resurrected and appears with the disciples uh, when he's having breakfast with them uh, by the beach. And um, he pulls Peter aside, remember? And, and tells Peter about his specific role, that he's going to be the rock upon which the church will be built. You know, there's a point at the Last Supper where he turns to Judas and says, go do what you have to do. So, Kurt, yeah, I think... Part of that training was Jesus recognizing and helping them recognize what their specific gifts are. So they were having breakfast after a Bible study? Is that what it was about? They did. <laughs> they did. So that's where we got the idea from. <laughs> that's it. We are very biblically based. <laughs> they had fish, though. Oh, they roasted fish. <laughs> I would have starved to death. <laughs> <laughs> so in the Gospel of Matthew, what did you say, Ross? <clears throat> you should have the bread. <laughs> so in the Gospel of Matthew, by the end of chapter 9, Jesus is heavily engaged in teaching, proclaiming the good news and curing illnesses. He has compassion for those he meets on his travels. And here's a quote from our scripture because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. What does it feel like to be harassed and helpless? That's kind of a low point. Mm. You don't feel good at all. Uh -huh. You usually lose your way too when you're depressed. Mm -hmm. Which way to turn or how to get yourself out of it feel isolated isolated yeah depressed depressed that's a good word yeah so Hopeless, frustrating even huh? frustrating frustrating you know you want to strike you want to do something but you don't know what to do mm. maybe it's like some of these small business owners uh have lost their whole livelihood mm -hmm. yeah they don't know where to turn to Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a good friend who, um, he's a restaurant owner, and one day we were, we were distanced, but on his uh, front lawn talking, and he said everything was going so well. We did everything right, that everything was right where it needed to be, and then it all just tanked. Mm. You know, it's, you know, you build all that up and for no, nothing that you did, it all just disappears in front of you. So what does it mean to be a sheep without a shepherd? Probably walk around in circles, not knowing yeah. where to go. Yeah. Wandering around aimlessly. Uh-huh. 
you know, wandering aimlessly and not having any clear trajectory, any clear plan or purpose adds to that helplessness and that frustration and that isolation even. And you look for somebody to lead. Mm -hmm. And you, while you're walking around, perhaps you follow somebody who isn't the best role model for mm -hmm. you uh, mm -hmm. as a sheep. You know, you just grab onto somebody who seems to have some authority and, and roll with that one. Yeah. Yeah. Dangerous thing, right? You know, it's the uh, cliche of, it. you know, any drink of water in the desert, right? If right. you're, if you're without leadership and you, and you feel aimless, if you feel helpless, you're, you're more prone to grab on to the first person or thing that claims authority. And that may not be the best thing or person for you. Well, maybe Jesus taught the disciples to be like a border collie. The border collies kind of uh, were the disciples of the shepherd, keeping those sheep in line and keeping them together. Mm. Without a sheep, just being a follower, and that's the old thing, you'd be following them right off the cliff if you're following the wrong one. Uh -huh. right. mm -hmm. Who's the Amish guy there that just came on? Nah. <laughs> yeah, he snuck technology into the village. <laughs> so Jesus sees a great need and a hunger in people as he travels throughout the cities, the villages, and the countryside. And he compares it to a harvest time when the crop is ready and laborers are needed. If there aren't enough laborers to maximize the moment, then the full benefit of the time is lost. Now, Jesus, he, he believes prayer is the first step. You know, whenever you look through the Bible, whenever Jesus is about to do something big, he stops and he prays first. Whether it's beginning his ministry or when he's about to be arrested, um, any major moment in his ministry, the first thing Jesus does is he retreats and he prays. To pray is an acknowledge um, of a need for assistance, particularly in dealing with people who have needs. The laborers of Christ still need a shepherd. And Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. It's not just laborers who are needed, but those who are open to labor for Christ. So how do you think prayer could assist in getting laborers? How does prayer help? It can give you focus. Okay. Yeah, it could give you a feeling of confidence that okay. uh, you know that God is with you. Mm -hmm. So why might the Lord be concerned about the harvest? Because you're not harvesting crops, you're harvesting people. Mm. Followers, believers, bringing people uh -huh. to the fold. And one thing I really like about that, I mean, none of us are really farmers. I mean, I have no green thumb at all. I kill everything. <laughs> but, you know, comparing this idea of, of gaining <clears throat> followers to a harvest, it adds some urgency, right? Because the harvest, you only have a specific amount of time to work in. If you miss your opportunity, then the plants are just going to die. And you're going to lose all of that crop. So what Jesus, I think, is saying is this is the time where we have to act. We can't take our time. We can't dilly-dally. We don't have forever. This is the moment that God has given us. And we need to take advantage of it. And God has blessed Jesus with laborers, right? He has his disciples. 
And so Jesus gathers his own disciples, whom he's called, and he gives them the authority to heal. It's interesting to note, if you didn't, if you notice, the disciples, when they're listed, did you notice they're listed in pairs? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, they're two by two as they list their names. They say Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. Spoiler alert. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But yeah, so Jesus, it's, it's as if he recognizes that we have this set amount of time, and even though I'm God, I'm still only one person. So we need to, to divvy up our responsibilities. We need to, to spread out so that we can have maximum impact during this time. I think Jesus, uh, Judas was all by himself purposely, so no one would try to talk him out of doing what he was mm -hmm. going to do. Because he had to do it. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So no, it's, a, it's an interesting take. It's a good take. Yeah. My um, my first congregation, uh, my I was an associate pastor. My senior pastor used to to use the same image all the time. That he said, "I have the easy job." I talk to, to all of you on a Sunday or on a Wednesday or whatever and, and bring the word of God to, to this set group. But then you have the difficult job that now you go out. And he called, he called our congregation the frontline ministers of our congregation. He said, you're the ones who go out on the front lines in your everyday uh, life. And all the lessons that you're gaining on a Sunday morning or a Saturday morning in a Bible study or a Wednesday night, you're going to take all those lessons and now it's your job to transmit that into your daily life. And that's a lot of what is happening with Jesus and the disciples here, right? Jesus spent a year of an intensive training with these disciples. I mean, it continues for three years. He's with them in total. But this is the first moment where Jesus says, okay, the training wheels are starting to come off a little bit. And now I'm not just going to, you're not just going to be a recipient. Now you're going to be a leader. You're going to be uh, the transmitter of this good news. You're going to be the one that's going to bring healing. You're the one that's now going to bring hope. So what would it feel like to be a student of Jesus and then to be commissioned to heal and cast out unclean spirits? It'd be a little scary. Okay. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> That's a lot of responsibility. Right on, right? And I'm thinking powerful, uh, you know, that I can do this in Jesus' name. Yeah. Yeah, it's both, right? It's, it's terrifying. On one hand, that now I have all this responsibility on me, but it's incredibly empowering also. And Jesus fills with that reassurance that even though you're going out, you're not going out alone. Right. You're not doing this on your own. Number one, I have a partner with you. You're going to have a partner that's, that's there with you. And even more so, you're doing this with my power. It's not just you. You have my presence with you as, as you do that. So is that our calling today? To heal and cast out unclean spirits? Today and every day. Yeah. Not literally, but... Uh, okay. Yeah, that's our calling. Okay. All right, so how so? Especially if we're saying not literally, because we're Lutherans, we're uncomfortable with this whole unclean spirit and healing, and, and well, all we, that. We have to uh, lead by example. We have to not be shy about our beliefs and convictions. Uh huh. Again, knowing that uh, the spirit is with us, and we even if we make mistakes, we're not going to do anything wrong in spreading the word. Or setting a good example. Uh huh. And I liken it to um, 
the whole Stephen ministry that we have at the church where we go and we train people for 50 hours to provide, uh, you know, help so they can walk along people who need some help at that time. So it, it just, it's all wrapped up in that ministry for me. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm a others huge. Others as we love ourselves. Go ahead, Russ. Loving others as we love ourselves. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, Patty, to your point, I am a, a huge <clears throat> proponent to Stephen Ministry. And not just because <clears throat> of the pastoral care that it provides, but because of the message it sends to the congregation. I think it's an important lesson that it follows that model of the disciples. First, you get well-trained and you're given a great support system and you're empowered to do the work of, of the spirit with, right. with the congregation. I think it's, it's an incredibly important lesson that goes when done right. It doesn't just apply to pastoral care. It sets a model for all kinds of ministry throughout the congregation. What do you think the life with the disciples was like during that first year with Jesus, during that training year? Couldn't have been easy because uh, the, probably the people that were coming in contact didn't want to hear anything. Mm. They were probably, you know, shunned, basically. Mm. Probably a lot of self-doubt as to, can I really do this? Mm. Mm. Yeah, remember, these are, the, these are the flunk outs that are following Jesus. These are the ones that didn't graduate to the next level of Hebrew school. That's why they're working with their dads. <clears throat> so these are guys who have been told that they're not good enough. They were told they're not smart enough, that they're, they're not well-read enough, that they don't have what it takes to be a rabbi, to be a leader, to be a, a religious authority. And now Jesus spends a year filling them with knowledge, and then he tells them, all right, time to go. You're going out. Yeah, again, on one hand, that's got to be incredibly empowering for them, right? They've been told their whole life that they're not good enough. And now Jesus is telling them, you have this power. You have my power to do these amazing things. But on the other hand, if they're like me, you got to be a little bit terrified. Well, like pushing the baby bird out of the nest. They're not, uh, you know, <laughs> they don't know that they're ready to fly yet. Yeah. I had, um, I had a seminary professor who... Uh, toward the end of my, my time in seminary, talked about his first day as a pastor. He said, and I was all excited. I went into my office. I set up my desk. I got everything all set to go. And I sat down and I said, well, now what? You know, <laughs> what do I do now? <laughs> and it's true, you know, in any job, right? In, in yeah. anything that we do, you know, there's that moment where we're like, well, now what? What do we do? And then, and then your job just kind of happens, right? And you start to react to when, what comes at you. A lot yeah. of trial and error. I lost you there, Derek. A lot of trial and error. Absolutely. And the disciples had a lot of that, right? They had a lot of error throughout this whole thing. I mean, Jesus is calling Peter Satan at one point. They're arguing over who has the, the greatest seat in heaven, who will be at Jesus' right hand. They don't understand the lessons that Jesus is, is trying to teach them. They bail out when, when it's the most critical moment um, in the ministry. There's a lot of trial and error throughout this, this whole process, throughout the three years that they have. It's what makes it that much more miraculous and, and amazing and encouraging to us that these were the people that changed the world. I mean, they were the ones that, that, that really brought about this, this new church, this new understanding. And it was a bunch of screw-ups that did it. <laughs> you know, it was the, kid, it was the kids at the, at the back of the class. 
the ones Why did you put Owen on the screen when you said that? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's an incredible <laughs> message, I think, for me, when I have my moments where I don't feel adequate, where, where I don't feel like, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've said in my last almost 20 years, they didn't train me for this. Mm-hmm. You know, they I, they taught me Greek and Hebrew and they, you know, taught me how to break down scripture and all this other stuff. But, you know, they, they don't teach you, you know, how to be there with somebody when they've lost their loved one. You know, they don't they don't tell you how to deal with a congregation that now can't gather physically, you know, and and doing online worship services or, you know, whatever, whatever ministry throws at you and you know that's for me as a pastor but i'm sure the same is for you in your different roles whether it's as um, a spouse or a parent or a sibling or a worker or a friend you know there are so many times where we feel like man i wasn't trained for this you know when i graduated the police academy I immediately left for my uh, military duty. And when I got back like three weeks later with some days off in between, everybody else was like an experienced officer after mm. three weeks. I didn't know what the heck was going on. Oh, talk about a fish out of water. Yeah. Yeah, but you, what do you do, right? You just dive in yeah, exactly. and you figure it out. I had some good mentors too. Uh-huh. That's important. And again, that's, that's the network that Jesus is building in that first year so that they have one another. I mean, you know, in that critical moment when Jesus is arrested, what happens? They all scatter, right? Yeah. But the good thing is that what Jesus instilled in them, and we're way off the Bible study at this point, but who cares? Um, <laughs> but, but obviously Jesus trained them well because at first it looks like they all failed right? They deny Jesus, they run away, they hide. But what do they do after they they run away? They come back together. They do. They all come back together and they're still in hiding, but they do it together. So maybe the most important thing that Jesus was building in that first year, more than any kind of formal lesson, was to build that community. So that even when one of them would fail, they still had each other. Yeah. And it's only then when they're all together, right, that the spirit comes in and then kind of supercharges them and sends them out. And from that moment, man, they're a force to be reckoned with. Because they go, they totally flip a switch at Pentecost. They go from a group of doubters, a group of uh, fearful people, a uh, timid group in hiding, to a group that now is standing up to the greatest authority in Rome, <laughs> you know, that are willing to sacrifice their lives and be arrested and be martyred uh, for the faith. They, you know, they, they make it through that low period, that, that period where they probably felt like sheep without a shepherd where they felt like they were scattered and helpless and harassed. And, and because they stuck together, they were able to make it through. So I'm going to shift gears just a little bit here. Jesus gives clear instructions to the disciples to not interact with the Gentiles. Right. Or the Samaritans. Or the Samaritans, right? Now, is it that Jesus doesn't care about the Gentiles or the Samaritans? No, No. he obviously does, because Jesus specifically reaches out to both of those groups at, at other times. But for this lesson, for this moment that Jesus is teaching them, he's saying the time isn't right yet to harvest that crop. That crop's not ready yet. Maybe because he doesn't think the disciples are ready for that yet. Maybe well, he's also, saying, go ahead. And also, the, the Jews were the chosen race by God. And maybe he's got to get them straightened out before they can spread out. Right. So Jesus places a priority on the Jews in this lesson here. 
and he requests his disciples to begin their work with them in very specific ways. He tells them, as you go, proclaim the good news that the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead. Raise the dead, he's telling them. Man, I mean, setting the bar high. <laughs> Cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Plus, he says, do it without pay. Right, right. I try to ignore that that line in the Bible. <laughs> Different world. What do you what do you think? I'm gonna stop the recording for that part. <laughs> so what's the most surprising aspect to you of the commissioning of the disciples? Surprising aspect? Yeah, is there anything that's surprising there? It's surprising to me that the Jews didn't go along with it. Mm. I mean, the power of God should have been enough to uh, make them believers. Well, don't the the average Jew probably didn't realize Jesus was resurrected either. As far as they know, he he's dead. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Are there any examples of the disciples raising people from the dead or during leprosy? Are any examples that they do that later on? Yeah, in Acts, they do. By the time they get to Acts, they start actually recording them doing those things. Peter, uh, Peter does. Well, Acts basically begins after Pentecost, right? Right, right. Um, well, it actually begins just before what? Pentecost. <clears throat> this is still in chapter 1. At the end of chapter 1 is when Jesus ascends um, before them. So remember, Acts and Luke, the Gospel of Luke, they're written by the same author. Right. So they overlap for a chapter. So the last chapter of Luke is almost, it's not identical, but it's very similar um, to the first chapter of Acts. So Acts is like the second volume of, uh, of that work. But then, yeah, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, that's the start of Pentecost uh, story. Yeah. So Jesus compared the opportunities of his day to harvest time. He's well aware of the urgency associated with the season of harvest. So there's no time or reason to procrastinate. Jesus knew that workers were needed to do specific tasks in a timely manner. So for us, how is it harvest time in our community? What urgency is there? What opportunity is there for us right now that we didn't have before and we may not have in the future? It's the lost sheep. How many lost sheep are out there right now with everything that's going around? Yeah trying to gather those sheep in to, you know, help protect them and give them the tools they need. That's, mm -hmm. that's just how I see it. Yeah, very good. Anybody else? What's the opportunity that's, that's here in this time right now for us? There are less distractions in the world right now, and right now we have more people's attention. Mm -hmm. or the potential to have more people's attention and you, know, you mentioned to having church service out there in the front well that's gonna certainly <laughs> people driving by and realizing that their service is going on that's certainly going to help church absolutely, absolutely. Help Derek how are there less distractions with everything that's going on there's no baseball there's no sport. everybody's distracted now with the protests the riots all over the world well just general distractions you know there's no new television shows no new sports you know we're all looking to focus on something right and look at our outreach our outreach is different now you know we're doing um services you know in a way where we can share it with anybody who would like to look at how many people are joining the services from different states and stuff for us so different it's countries a, even right have people from around the world that are tuning in now right right so you have the opportunity which is much broader than 
um, if we were just hitting the streets in Deer Park. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a great opportunity. Yeah, for a few weeks I was doing watch party when we were doing the services, and I do it through um, the Deer Park community page on Facebook. And no. I actually had people coming in, going out. Some people stuck around. Some people just, uh -huh. you know, kind of moved along. But you know, it's <laughs> it's putting us out there. Mm -hmm. In fact, our soup kitchen and wine there is just going to open in two weeks. Oh, that's so, great. That's yeah. great. But those people really need it. They do. They do. It's been a tough time for them. Is it going to be back to normal where they're having people sit down there, or no? They, no, they won't be able to. They won't be able to dine in. They're going to get food in a bag, and they're going to have to take it home. Yeah. They, they won't be any interaction inside at all. Oh boy. Yeah. Well, at the North Babylon High School, Science they've been space. doing breakfasts and lunch through the district. They made because um, Susan still keeps in contact. That she used to work, you know, for the, for the lunch program there. Um, I think she said Thursday they, they made 1,500 sandwiches just for lunch. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's probably about six or eight of them that are actually there, and they're trying to get it to continue throughout the summer, not just, uh, you know, now that school's going to be over soon, that, you mm -hmm. know, it just stops. And so they're really trying to keep it, – it's nice to see that, you know, these people I'll are tell you, Russ, and doing this. Russ, the 12 I had were delicious, too. <laughs> <laughs> You drove through 12 times, Joe? Yeah. <laughs> Put a different hat on each time. It's like That's Halloween when you change your costume. That's right. When you find that house that has the good candy and you swap your costumes <laughs> and your friends. <laughs> yep. <laughs> no, there's, there's a lot of opportunity now, you know, and um, not to go too far down this rabbit hole, but... On one hand, Joe, you had mentioned the distraction with the protests, but on the other hand, those who are protesting are seeing this as the opportunity um, to, to bring change. Yeah. So in, in, like defunding the police and abolishing the police? That would be some great change, wouldn't it? Well, if you if we fully explore what that is, I mean, that's a whole nother discussion that we would have. That's not even a Bible study. <laughs> no, no. Well, it's needy people, isn't it? I mean, uh, in Minneapolis, they want to close permanently that precinct, and the response time would go from five minutes to fifteen minutes. And if you're having a problem, you know, I don't think you'd want to wait that extra 10 minutes. Or you can call a social worker. That's what they want to do. Well, there's a whole other discussion that's going to go into that that I'm not going to get us get us bogged into for. Okay, for we don't have enough time anyway. No, well, we could have days and we wouldn't <laughs> scratch the surface. But in order to expand his mission, Jesus calls his disciples and sends them out in twos. They're asked to do tasks beyond their human powers. Specifically, they're asked to cure, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, even cast out demons. Now, they couldn't do any of that without God's Spirit empowering them to do so. Jesus continues to call disciples to be sent out in his mission to do things beyond their human capabilities. There's such a need as people search for meaning and healing in their lives. Today, no matter the season of the year, it's harvest time for us. So our last question, what does it mean for you to partner with Jesus in mission? What do you think Jesus is calling you to do? What's your harvest time? I think he wants all of us to be disciples. Mm -hmm. That could be every day. I feel a calling for like compassion, giving people compassion um, as they struggle through whatever struggles they have right now, instead of trying to say, oh, you should get over it or something like that, realize that it's real for that person. And um, my compassion has been uh, raised and I'm always thinking of Jesus at the back of what I'm doing for mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. 
think for me it's more of an awareness. I'm more aware of what other people are going through. I mean, maybe it's because I have more time to do that, but it's, it's you really, I don't know, you kind of see it from okay, a different way. Great. Did you tell folks up uh, That's good. Anybody else? Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, what does it mean for you to be a laborer? What's God calling you to do? Yes, Peggy, I think that to me is I always ask the question, what would Jesus do? Mm -hmm. How would he how would he do that? I need some help. Um, oh, he's there for me or with me, um, as uh, Patty said, to show compassion and I think we lack that a lot in our lives. Um, and that's what I think he helps me with, is to recognize other people's feelings. Yeah. What they go what they what they're going through. Mm -hmm. uh, I think with the pandemic, um, all the people like I said that need help, need food. I never realized that people were in such bad shape. You know, missing one paycheck that's not know where to turn. Mm -hmm. so Jesus helps you having that compassion. Thanks, Kurt. Well, I wound up in the soup kitchen. I felt it was a calling. Mm -hmm. And uh been about eight years now. And uh, I do see the other side a lot. Most of the people are minorities, and uh, and most of the people are grateful for what we're doing. It makes me feel good about what I'm doing. There you go. Well, good. Thank you, everyone. Thank Quick you. question, Pastor. Sharp. Sure. Are you going to have the youth challenge this year? Uh, with the Mohawk? Yeah. Yeah, well, um, it's supposed to be next summer, uh, but I'm I'm getting bored, so maybe uh, maybe it's time to, to do it. I'm due for a haircut, actually. I got one yesterday. They and finally opened up. So I had I asked. Get it shaved. I asked Jen um, to cut my hair, and she said, "Well, the barber shop's open again. You can go over there." And said, "Now I'm now I I had it better. I like when you do it. You do it again." <laughs> Tell hey, Pastor, what I look like for tomorrow. Pastor, have you got any information yet whether they're going to have the beach Bible study this year? Yeah, they were just talking about that on Thursday. I'm almost certain that they're not going to have it. Oh, no. Well, yeah, I think um, because the limitations at the state park uh, were going to make it difficult from what I understand. Um, I, I don't think it looks very likely. But as, when I have information, I'll share it for sure. Okay, thank you. All right, why don't we uh, close with the Lord's Prayer? <coughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will, thy be, will done. be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. Give us, give us this day our daily, daily bread. bread. And forgive us, and our, forgive us our trespasses as, as we forgive those who trespass against us. us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 So All peace right. serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Sunday or Saturday. Enjoy the beautiful yeah, weather. Just everybody, keep me in your prayers on Wednesday. You are in a You will, day. for sure, Debbie. Thank you for joining okay. us. Yep. All right. Yep.